Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for making this provision for us to listen to your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will work in our hearts, grip us with the truths from your word and help us to live lives that will bring glory and honor to your name. Be glorified in our midst even now, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. I want to start by reading a passage from what we call as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus used this story to illustrate a very crucial point in our spiritual life. Let's read from Matthew chapter 7, <clears throat> verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell and great was its fall. Let's not get sidetracked in trying to understand this story by looking at the rock versus the sand. <clears throat> and people say the rock represents Jesus Christ. If you put your trust in him, that's fine. And you don't put your trust in sandy things that can just wash away. But that is going to miss the whole point of the story. What is the point of the story? Jesus is saying, when you hear the words of God, you can take it in two different ways. You can listen, but not do anything about it. The other thing is, you can listen and allow yourself to be gripped by it and give your life to doing whatever God wants us to do. This is the contrast Jesus is trying to bring here. Don't miss that. Because this is pointing out to us, even in these days, that it's not enough to listen to messages, appreciate the speakers or the writers, and think this is a good message. And say, I give so many marks for this message and leave it at that, and then go on to the next message next Sunday. No, Jesus is saying, don't let that happen. Be ones, be those who listen. Yes, they do listen, but after they listen, they put these things into practice in their daily life. If we are not doing that, like James the Apostle said, we are just hearers only, not doers of the word, then it, we, we, we will be deceiving ourselves. Faith without works is death. We think we have faith because we have heard the truths. We have even accepted the truths as being true. And we said, that's right. But we still may not do anything about it and our life doesn't change. We think we are believers we, because we believe these truths. But we are not doers of the word, we deceive ourselves. That's one kind of deception. Let's look at another kind of deception that commonly happens. This happened even in the days of Jesus. Many people came to him because he was healing their sicknesses, because he was feeding the hungry, he was even raising people from the dead, he was casting out demons. So many people came and experience these things in their life. But one, one day when the crowd came following him, Jesus said, I know why you are following me, not because you know who I am and you want to really follow me in my life, in the way I live. No, you are coming because you were fed with the five loaves and the two fish. Now, are we like that? Do we think we have come to Jesus, we have, been, become, we have become children of God because we have experienced some healing 
or some intervention from God in our difficult situation. We prayed and God answered our prayer miraculously. Is that what we think makes us related to God? No. Because God is good. God is gracious. He even gives the rain to the wicked people. He gives food to the hungry people even if they are unbelievers or even atheists. Because he is good. And just because we have experienced some good things from his life, from his side, we shouldn't imagine that things are all fine between us and God. No. It's not enough to just believe. We need to be able to be gripped by our, in our heart and do the things that God wants us to do. It's not enough to have a touch from God in our daily life or in, our, in an area of our life where we really saw that God is supernatural, God is real, Jesus is real, He answers prayer. It's not enough for all these things. We need to be born again. And how does that happen? There is only one way to be born again. Jesus came to save us from our sins. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. If we don't go to Jesus and receive this salvation from our Savior and surrender our lives to the Master, to the Lord, we don't have any relationship with Him. The first thing we have to do is to admit to ourselves that in the sight of this holy God who is fully light, without any darkness in Him, without any shadow, completely light, when we stand before Him, who, how do we see ourselves? Sinners with many, many, many records of sin against us, accusing us. When we become aware of how sinful we are in the sight of God, we cry out to God, have mercy on me, Lord, this sinner. And then God is able to give us this forgiveness because Jesus has already taken our punishment. God is a holy God. God is also a righteous God. Our sins, once they have been committed, they need to be punished. And we are the ones who deserve that punishment. We are the ones who deserve to go to hell and be there for eternity. But because He loved us so much, God loved us so much, He is offering this salvation free to us by taking the pain of punishment on Himself, on His Son. And when we believe that, we go to Him, trust in Jesus as our Savior, and receive this forgiveness freely as a gift from God. That is how we get born again. And when we get born again, what would be our natural, normal response to Him? We will give our life to Him as living sacrifices and say, Lord, tell me what you want me to do. All the things that you tell me, I will do. I don't want to go after anyone else. I don't want to go after anything else. I want to follow you. That is the mark of a person who is born again. It's not enough just to have ideas, agree with those ideas. It is not enough just to have experiences in our life. No, we need to be born again. Jesus made it extremely clear. Unless you are born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of God. John chapter 3. So that is how we come to a relationship with God, a proper relationship with God. And when we have come to a proper relationship with God, how do we live after that? Is it just a matter of going to church regularly? Is it just a matter of reading one chapter of the Bible every day just to see that, okay, I have done that part or spend some time in prayer? Or maybe some people are more um, zealous and they will go for Bible studies and prayer meetings and start watching messages, maybe all that. But how do we have to actually live as a disciple of Jesus Christ? Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And Jesus was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily 
and follow me. Many people have this wrong idea that taking up this cross means there is somebody who is a troublesome person in my life and that is the cross I have to bear with, deal with. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying every day in your life, you have to take up your cross, deny yourself and follow me. In Jesus' days, when anybody saw somebody with a cross on his shoulders walking towards the, the hill, all, all people knew this man is not going to be alive at the end of the day. He is going to be dead at the end of the day. So what does it mean for us to take up our cross daily and deny ourselves? See, if we want to follow Jesus in the way he lived, and to become like him more and more in our character, in the way we look at things, we look at people, the way we think and react and respond to situations, the way we make decisions, the way we speak, the way we deal with different situations, in all these things, if we want to follow Jesus, what do we have to do? Deny ourselves. Why is it that we have to deny ourselves? Because there are so many things inside us which tell us to do something else that pleases us. What is that? If I do this, I'll get more pleasure. If I do that, I can make more money. If I go that way, I will become more famous. Everybody will appreciate me, admire me. And I can enjoy life. I can eat this. I can go there and see all those things. That is what I feel like doing from myself and though, so Jesus says if you want to follow me you have to deny yourself all these desires that come up from inside me my nature that comes up every day every day I have to take up my cross and decide that I am not going to live by myself I am not going to live for myself this old me is going to die Actually, the Bible says we have been crucified with Christ. That's the position we have to take every day. I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for this Jesus. Therefore, I will deny myself all these things that turn me away or distract me from following Jesus. That is how a disciple has to live every day. Of course, we stumble. We may stumble because of ignorance. We may stumble because of our weaknesses. We may stumble because things were uh, unexpected, suddenly came upon us and we didn't know what to do. So we may stumble in many ways. James the Apostle says we all stumble in many ways. Now, when we stumble, God knew that we would stumble. So he has already made a provision for us so that we can get up from where we stumbled and start walking again following Jesus. There is forgiveness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us away from all those unrighteous things. That is God's promise. But our daily life has to be, as a disciple, following Jesus, denying myself and following Jesus. When we seriously try to do this, we come face to face with a big enemy in our life. When we say big enemy, we may suddenly think about the devil as an enemy. Yes, he is a big enemy. But he will have no power in us if there was, an, if there was no other enemy. There is, there is in fact another enemy collaborating with him. And that is why the devil is able to get access to our life and touch our lives and you know tempt us and try to make us fall yes it's not people who are our enemies even though there are people who are enemies to us i am not talking about them at this time i am talking about the enemy that we carry around with us somebody has said like this when i came to the christian life i discovered that my greatest enemy for my spiritual life was myself. Because there is something in us that resists this following after Jesus. And that is called 
in the Bible, in the New Testament as our flesh. Sometimes our flesh refers to a part of our body, flesh and blood, flesh and bones and all these things. But many times it refers to another part of our life which affects our spiritual life. Let's understand what it means from this particular verse. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now here flesh is described as something that has passions and desires. These are sinful passions and desires. In, in simple words we can describe the flesh as a place in us that produces these passions and desires. Here it says, uh, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That is what we are supposed to do. Keep these passions and desires sinful as they are always pinned to the cross, not allowing them to come to life, not allowing them to take place in our life, they may, if uh, we will not listen to those temptations, we will deny ourselves when those temptations come in order to follow the way of Jesus. That is what is supposed to happen. But we may fall because of ignorance and, and suddenness and all these things, yes. So what we find is the more we seek earnestly to follow Jesus, and the more determined we are to deny ourselves and to follow Jesus, we find a war which is going on inside us. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 and 17. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. So here we find the Holy Spirit who has come to abide in us when we were born again. He finds this resistance coming from our flesh with all these lusts and desires. And he is fighting against our flesh to subdue it so that we can follow him and do the will of God and be able to follow Jesus. That is the war that is going on within us. The spirit is trying to fight against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. So what are we supposed to do? The, verse 16, walk by the spirit. Don't listen to the flesh, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. That is how we are supposed to walk. Unfortunately, some Christians have come to think in a wrong way that Jesus has won the victory. He is abiding in us. We are in him. We are a new creature. All th old things have passed away and all such verses from here and there, which actually refer to the position God wants us to be. Doesn't necessarily mean that we are already in that position. We are walking towards that position. Put you know, working out our salvation with fear and trembling so that we can be where God wants us to be. And that is the position God wants us to be, living in total victory, overcoming every temptation, rejoicing in the victory Jesus has made for us. All that is true, but the actual fact of the matter is we are still not there yet. We are on the way towards that. If we don't recognize that fact and if we don't recognize this battle that is going on inside us, we will be taken unawares. We will be deceived by the evil one. That should not happen. We should know the truth and the truth will show us how to be set free. Let's look at James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Now, lust is a word for strong desire, not necessarily connected with sexual lust, but a strong desire to do our own will in various ways so that we can get some advantage, we can enjoy some pleasure and various things like that. So every one of us is tempted because of these lusts that are coming up 
from our flesh. When lust has conceived, that means we give in to this lust, we agree with this lust. And after conception, it gives birth to sin, that means the actual action comes out. We have actually committed a sin physically, externally, or it could be even in our thought, we, you, we keep on imagining something and chew over it and get all the bit, uh, pleasure and all that. When we do that, that way also we have yielded and we have conceived a sin even though it's still in our mind and it may finally come out in an action. Then it brings forth death. Now imagine like this. Even if we are all alone by ourselves, this is what happened to some of the people who thought they could be free from sin if they isolated themselves. They went into monasteries, they went on a hilltop and sat under a tree and all that, away from all you know, interferences from people around them. And they thought that's how they could become holy people. They found they could not become holy because they, wherever they went, they carried this flesh with them. And this flesh, this flesh kept on producing lusts and desires. And it, they were playing in their mind, even if they did not do anything externally, they kept on polluting their mind. So it is, even if there is no provocation coming from anywhere outside, we can still be tempted to do wrong because inside us, in our flesh, there are these lusts and desires that tempt us. Now we, sometimes we, people think that we are tempted by the devil. Yes, the devil also tempts us, but how is he able to tempt us? Because he knows the kind of desires we have in our flesh. When he makes a suggestion, putting an idea into our head, it suddenly provokes a desire from our flesh in correspondence with that idea. And that's how we feel the temptation. If the devil put some idea into our mind and there was no flesh in us, there was no such desire for such things that he was suggesting, we would not accept those suggestions. But there is a corresponding desire coming up from our flesh. He knows that. That's why he's putting those ideas into our mind according to the situation of the moment, according to what we have been you know, planning to do and all that. He puts some ideas into our mind and that is also how we are getting tempted. So, we are tempted because of the lust in our flesh. We are also tempted by the devil who puts ideas into our mind, just like he put ideas into Jesus' mind when he was in the wilderness. In, in, at other times, the world around us, people put ideas into our mind. The attractions of the world pull us. Why, that, why we feel that pull is because we have similar desires in our flesh. For fun, for games, for enjoyment, for thrill, for pleasure, of various types. So every sin we, we commit gives us some pleasure. That is why we commit those sinful things. If every time we sinned it caused us pain, we would stop sinning. But it doesn't cause us pain. It gives us an immediate pleasure. It is only for a moment. Afterwards there comes sorrow. There comes confusion, there comes judgment, there comes guilt, all kinds of things follow afterwards. But this uh, temptation comes to us as an attractive offer. You know, there were some sweets in the olden days. It, the outside was sweet and inside, in the cavity inside the sweet was some chocolate or something like that. Eclairs like that. But then a few years ago, there were people who were selling drugs to school children. The outwardly, it looks like a sweet, but inside is a small portion of drug. And when the children get hooked to this drug, they will ask for buying it. And that's how the business grows. Anyway, so what happens is the offer of temptation is very, may look very attractive because there is a pleasure involved, there is some advantage involved. But we must not forget the fact hidden inside is poison. Hidden inside is going to cause us pain, unhappiness, guilt, condemnation, wanting to hide ourselves, wanting even to commit suicide. All these things come after we have sinned. 
So, but when we are being tempted to sin, all these things don't appear to our mind. All that appears to our mind is the attraction of the pleasure that is being offered. So, let's not get fooled. Let's understand what is going on. Romans chapter 7 verses 18 to 20. Paul is giving a description of his experience. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. For if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one who doing it, but sin which dwells in me. See, remember, he is saying all these things in the present tense. Some people wrongly have attributed this to his experience before conversion. And now that they are born, he is born again, his experience is in Romans chapter 8, not in 7. That's how they argue. But the fact is, he is using this in the present tense. And any honest Christian who looks at his own life will have to admit that this is true about themselves. There is a part of them that wants to please God. Whatever God wants us to do, we want to do that. But there is another part of us which is tempting us to sin. We, in other words, we are talking about two parts. One is the new man we, whom we have received when we were born again. God has given us his nature, his new nature, but that is in a, a small form. It has to grow and grow and become bigger and bigger. But there is already something opposing the Holy Spirit inside us, our flesh, with its lusts and desires. And sometimes this one gains power over us, this flesh gets power over us, and we are urged to follow after the Spirit, walk after the Spirit, and then we will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. That is how we are supposed to live. One great man of God has expressed this as, in a book he has called, Two of Me. There are two of me. He is not talking about a split personality or anything like that. No, he is saying, there is a war going on within me. The Holy Spirit is at war with the flesh. And the flesh is at war with the Holy Spirit. Which side will we be on? Okay, even if we slipped up, that doesn't mean everything is gone. There is no hope for me. No, we all slip up, maybe. But it doesn't mean we have to stay down there in hopelessness, feeling guilty. No, there is hope for us. God can forgive us our sins if we confess them. We can get up and start walking again or start running again towards Jesus, following Jesus. That's how we are supposed to be. So don't let anyone deceive us. Don't let us be con you know, content with mere accepting of certain truths, certain doctrines, and thinking that just because we believe those things, we are born again, no. Or just because we have had some supernatural experiences in life, no, showing us that God exists and God is able to do things for us. Just because we have experienced that, don't let us be content with that. Let us actually make sure we are born again and that we are walking on this path following Jesus. Now, I want to show you some pictures to illustrate this in a, in a, in a, a schematic form. Okay, here's the picture. In the beginning, there, are, there is this event or something that happens to us or there is also the devil who is trying to make use of an event to create certain ideas in our mind, to put certain ideas into our mind. And then what happens? Either this event provokes us or the devil provokes us. What happens is that our flesh gets provoked and our flesh puts up certain desires Maybe try to hide itself. Maybe, you know, try to, you know, tell us that take action immediately. Just tell a lie and get away from this difficult situation or go after it. You can make more money. Go after it. You can get pleasure, pleasure of various kinds. Look there, see what that person is offering you. All these things are happening. And then what do we do? We 
make a decision. That's using our will. We make a decision and say, okay, this is what I am going to do now. If we follow according to the flesh, we sin, we get defeated spiritually. If we deny ourselves and say no to our fleshly desire, we get victory. So victory or defeat can come to us because we our will makes the choice. Now what we want to understand is, just because some temptation came to us, we shouldn't imagine that we have already become guilty, already become defiled or anything like that. This is a, something that is coming to us as an offer or an allurement, enticement. We don't have to give in to them. The Bible says, Romans chapter 8 says, we are not obliged. We don't have any obligation to follow the desires of the flesh. Because now we are a new man working in us. The Holy Spirit is in us. If we yield to the Holy Spirit, we don't have to overc We don't have to yield to these desires of the flesh. Then, when we choose to obey the Holy Spirit instead of our fleshly desires, we get victory. When we get victory today, it doesn't mean automatically victory will be there tomorrow. No. Tomorrow again we are going to be tempted, maybe with a slight twist. Maybe slightly different in, the, in its approach. We again have to make this choice whether we will yield to the flesh or we will obey the Holy Spirit. And that is how we become a victorious Christian or a defeated Christian. Even after we have been born again, we can still be a defeated Christian. Because we have not understood there is a victory possible for us. We have not understood how to depend on the Holy Spirit for victory. We try ourselves various tricks and techniques and all that, they don't work. But once we understand the Word of God and the Word of God shows us how to get this victory, how to make the right decision, we can have victory. Okay, now let's go a little bit more deep uh, into this picture. Now I have brought in a new element, the mind, there in, in the middle. Now, why I, am, why I am bringing that is to illustrate one small point. Imagine the first time we are tempted with something. We never expected it. We don't know what kind of temptation it is, what can happen if we yield. Nothing happened, no, no, nothing we know, and we may fall. But when we fall, we have an opportunity to look at what happened. Why did I fall? We can ask God, Lord, tell me how I fell, what I should have done. We read the word of God and find out how to deal with this kind of temptation. What does God say about this? So the next time when the temptation comes again, the same temptation comes again, we are mentally more prepared to face this temptation and to be able to say, no, I'm not taking it anymore. I'm not going to yield to it then we can have victory. So the mind, this thinking process has come into the picture. Now in our thinking process, we understand this and we understand this, we understand what God says, we understand what the devil is offering us, we think about them and we make a choice based on our understanding and according to our knowledge about the word of God and all that. So our mind is a big player in this game. So the lusts are coming up from the flesh, the mind has to, th has to think about it and the will has to make a decision about what we should do. And then it ends up in a certain type of action, either in defeat or in victory. Now let me bring some more elements into this picture. Now the mind is developed by the inputs it receives. We can listen to so much from the media, TV and uh, phones and newspaper and what people talk about and how people give book, write books and make speeches and all that. A lot of worldly stuff can come into our mind. That is one way of fulfilling our mind. The more time we spend on the media, TV or video or anything like that, we must remember that our we are allowing our mind to get filled with worldly ideas. We say, no, 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 I know what is a worldly idea. I know how to reject it and all that. No. 
psychologists have found out that if you keep exposed to your to certain ideas over a period of time they will begin to mold us so please be careful the other way we can do is to listen to the word of god we can read the word of god we can listen to preaching on the word of god we can talk to other people about the word of god and what we what jesus wants us to do the more we do it the worldly ideas that have crept in through the media and other places get overwritten by the word of god the ideas of the word of god then we realize okay people may think like that people may say like that but god says like this that is what i am going to do that is how our mind gets renewed romans chapter 12 verse 2 our mind has to get renewed so how can we allow this mind to get renewed fill ourselves with the word of god fill ourselves with the word of god also we have to control how much of this world we allow to get inside that's in our control see there are many things we cannot avoid as we walk down the road we see certain things we hear certain things people do certain things to us they talk to us we cannot avoid a lot of those things but there are things we can avoid how much we time we spend on the phone how much time we spend on the tv how much time we spend in the in the company of our worldly friends these are so many things like this which we can control if we don't control those things they will all be getting into our mind confuse our thinking replace godly values that we have derived from the sermon last sunday and all that with worldly ideas and we may think that we these ideas sound convincing and accept them that is where we have to be careful we are under attack okay we talked about the war against the flesh because it resides right inside us and produces all these lusts and desires the bible also talks about the attacks coming from outside from the devil his temptations and the world its attractions and its threats all these things come to us from outside we are in a battle who's on our side god is on our side the holy spirit residing in us is on our side and if we walk according to the spirit we shall not fulfill the desires of the spirit desires of the flesh sorry so colossians chapter 3 verse 16 let the word of god no, the, let the word of christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom teaching etc if we allow the word of god to richly dwell in us and that becomes our guide that becomes the direction we follow that shows us where we have gone wrong that shows us how to get victory that teaches us how to fight this battle in the right way without giving up how to defend ourselves how to take an offense against the devil's attacks all these things are coming from the word of god so let us look back at what we just heard how we are being tempted because of the lusts and desires in our flesh and how the holy spirit is at war with this flesh and how we need to yield to the holy spirit how we need to be led by the holy spirit in order to be able to follow the way jesus walked and how we need to take up our cross daily deny ourselves and walk with before god now if we take it lightly if our christian life is all about praise and worship and clapping hands and dancing around and all these things and we are not taking up this battle seriously what will happen is we will be deceived after years of having been born again we are still practically the same person the things trouble us exactly the same way they used to trouble us 5 years ago there is no growth there is no extra strength coming into our lives we are not in a position to help other people because we don't know how to help ourselves that is a pitiable state after we have been born again so brothers and sisters including me let us take this life seriously there is a battle going on for our souls let's not give up 
easily. Let's not yield easily. Let's fight this battle because there is a crown of life laid up in heaven for us. A crown of life, not gold and crown and things like that. A crown of life that God wants to give to us. May God help every single one of us. Thank you.